<laughs> Anyways, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Tactical Baby Gear Podcast. Uh, this is going to be a super interesting episode. Um, I'll tell you why in just a minute. Uh, you probably already know from the title. Uh, so it's going to be a tough one. I'm going to do my very best to not be super emotional and cry throughout this, uh, but it's very likely. But um, we don't have tissues. That's okay. That's okay. Um, anyways, I, so what I want to get into is, uh, my daughter was recently diagnosed with cancer, um, just before Christmas. And I, I want to go through it as sort of a, a linear progression of how this, how it came up, how we discovered it, how it happened, um, and where we are now. It's been a month already, which I can't even like believe because it feels like it's been a week. So it, it, it's been a lot. So I want to share the information with you. There's a lot of reasons why I want to share it with you because this is something that when this first kind of came up, my wife in particular didn't really want us to talk about publicly. And I kept thinking this is something that needs to be talked about, particularly particularly because we have this massive audience of parents and because it's Kendall's story. And Kendall's the whole reason Tactical Baby Gear exists. So I felt like it was the right thing to do uh, to share this story, to, to use our platform for the right reasons, you know, in, in, uh, in honor of Kendall. So, well, and it's certainly something that, uh, it's not an easy topic to, to talk about. As it's parent, not easy, so. but it's something that, you know, if, if you don't know what to look for and you don't know signs or what to look for, or maybe there's parents who read this, you know, they found this video because of the title and they're going through the same thing. Here's what you can expect. Here's learn from our experiences. And I will preface this by saying I am not a medical doctor. I'm going to screw up information, I'm sure, on the technicality side of things. So, and I will likely oversimplify some of the information and generalize quite a bit. But don't take it as medical knowledge. <laughs> I'll give you my experience and some of the things we've learned and what we think at this point. But So that's the basis of today's episode. Uh, I hope you stick around because this one is... It's going to be interesting for sure. So into her story and what we've got going on now with this cancer situation. Um, I, I, again, I want to sort of tell it as it happened and kind of unpack it along the way. So um, December 17th, Brandy and I went out to dinner. Amazing steakhouse. That Chop House 49, you guys, down in Shelter Cove. It's amazing. It's great. We get home. It's like 10, 1030 at night. Kids are already in bed. They're sleeping, whatever. Cameron and Kendall were like sleeping together in the same bed that night because it's like a Friday or Saturday night or whatever. And they were like watching movies and whatever. So we get home. We go upstairs. We let them know we're home. Everything's cool. No big deal. Brandy and I like brush our teeth. We get, I take the dog out and all this stuff. We finally get in bed. And then Cameron calls Brandy on the phone from upstairs. Uh, hey, you need to come up here. Kendall says her tummy hurts and blah, blah, blah. Like, come on, kid. Like, it's 11 o'clock, 1030. Like, we just got in bed. So we go upstairs. And she's like, yeah, there's a, there's like a lump on her stomach. I'm like, huh? So we like, I, I look at it and it's dark and the lights are off and whatever. So I go flip the lights on. Kendall comes downstairs and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And I pick up her shirt. And sure enough, it's like the top of her stomach, just below her sternum and her right side were, were both swollen a little bit and really hard, like knock on the table, hard, hard. And I'm like, when's the last time you went to the bathroom? <laughs> you know, cause like any parents like, okay, you got the, the checklist, you know, it's yeah. like, all right. Have you had anything to eat? Because is that why you're upset or screaming? Okay, have you gone poop? <laughs> yeah. And then you start checking down the list. Yeah. yeah so um, so it's like, when's the last time you went to the bathroom? She's like, this morning. And I was like, and everything was normal? Like, And she's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. She's, and she would just complain of like, a, you know, my, my tummy hurts, which is in, in kid language, it's like universal for anything that doesn't feel good is my tummy hurts, right? And... So I'm like, all right, well, this is kind of odd, but you know, we'll go to the doctor first thing in the morning and they'll tell us she's constipated and take some sort of laxative and or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Is what is going through my head at eleven o'clock on a Sat Saturday. It was Saturday it was night. Saturday. It was Saturday night. So of course I get in bed and I'm I like Google search. I'm like, who what 
what doctor's office is going to be open first thing Sunday morning, you know? Of course, it's not going to be the pediatrician that we go to usually. So it's like, okay, doctor's care, which is like the urgent care place uh, locally. And they open at like 9 a.m. or something. So I was like, okay, well, 9 a.m. We're going to doctor's care and we'll see what he has to say about it. So we get there and um, when they're checking us in, I kind of mentioned what was going on and, and that, you know, and they were like, well, we don't have an x-ray tech here on Sundays to do any kind of scans or anything. So I don't know that we can actually see you or not, but I'm going to go ahead and let the doctor see you and see what he has to say. So we sit and wait 10 minutes or whatever. We go into the doc into, um, in, you know, back into the doctor's office and the doctor comes in, looks at her. I don't think they even did vitals or anything. They didn't take her blood pressure, didn't take her temperature, weight. Like, he just, he like came in and was like, all right, what's going on? And he like touched it a little bit. Does this hurt? Does this hurt? Where does this hurt? And it was like, it only hurt if somebody pushed on it. And at that point she wasn't in pain. She didn't feel bad. She wasn't complaining about her tummy hurting anymore or any of those things, but it was like swollen and hard and it only hurt if you pushed on it. Like, okay. And, um, he's like, yeah, you probably ought to get this scanned. He's like, it could be constant, like that she's backed up. Like this is, you know, where your intestine does this and it crosses over here and it's a common place for it to get backed up. So, and it's like higher up in your abdomen, just again, kind of below your sternum to the side where your intestine kind of crosses over and it's, 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 um, common to get backed up in this little curve. He's like, it's, it's probably all it is, but I would get it scanned just to be sure. And you know, whatever. I think he likely knew at that point that something wasn't right. Cause he was like, you should probably go to the hospital right now and get this scanned. You'd want to set off too many alarm bells. Probably not. So I was like, okay, cool. I was like, awesome. Not how I thought Sunday morning was going to go, but we're off to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I call Brandy. I'm like, Hey, they couldn't really help us. They want to, they think we should get it scanned. And so we're going to go to the emergency room and just we'll go to the ER and get it scanned. She's like, okay, well, just let me know what happens, you know. Check into the emergency room. They take me back. Of course, I know like two or three of the nurses back there because I know everybody. I'm like, oh, hey, Jackie. Hey, hey, hey. I'm like, oh, hey, Beef, how's it going? I'm like, ah, yeah, she's, she's got a tummy ache, you know. So like, yeah, let's do a CT scan, blah, blah, blah. So we go back, we do CT scan. They take us back into the, to the room, the ER room, and we're sort of sitting around and waiting and waiting, and nurses come, and they like – check on us every few minutes or whatever like 30 minutes goes by and I remember the doctor walking in and being like okay so we got the scan back I was like uh-huh they're like this is about I feel like I'm gonna have the same feeling through my body saying this we got the scan back and she has a very large cancer tumor coming off of her kidney and in that moment, my entire life changed. The feeling that went through my body, it's like this cold shock almost. And I remember it going into my fingertips, just like this pulse of, and then it was like tunnel vision. And then I was like, and then I, as I had this tunnel vision, I'm like looking around and I noticed there was like four or five other people in the room, doctors and or nurses really, not doctors, but nurses that I think were like making sure that on the reaction side of me, that like everything was going to be okay. They were there for support or whatever. And I noticed it and I was like, okay, well, Jackie's in here. I didn't notice her before and she's in here and I recognize her. There was like four or five people in the room at that point. I had no idea. I was just focused on the doctor initially. And then I started like looking around and it was like this very surreal moment. And that all happened in like a split second where I noticed everybody, you know, but, um, it felt like time slowed down and then it was like next reaction was like, holy shit, how do I fix this? Is everything going to be okay? How bad is this? What is this? Um, and then like 4 million questions just start running through your head. But ultimately I'm like freaking out inside, but also really, really calm. Like that's usually my state, right? in a super high stressful situation where I'm really pissed off or anything, I go so calm and so chill and so mellow. That's when Brandy knows like, Oh crap, something bad's about to happen. Like 
he's about to put his hand through a wall. (laughs) (laughs) But it was the same thing, like super high stress. I can bring myself down like super chill and calm and think through things pretty clearly. So I'm like freaking out internally, externally, very chill, very calm, listening to what the doctor's saying. And I'm like, how do I fix this? What do we have to do? How bad is this? Is she going to live through this? Like all of that kind of stuff. I have to call Brandy. Brandy has to get here. These are what's, this is what's running through my head. And in the meantime, they're kind of waiting for me to say something. This is all just like processing. And I'm like, okay. Cause I feel it's probably like the first words I said, I was like, okay. And then she's like, do you want to go to Savannah or Charleston? And I was like, uh, I need to finish processing this. Like, I don't, like how soon do I need to get there? Like in the next couple of days, she's like, no, no, no. We're going to push an ambulance and like take you now. I was like, oh, this must be really bad. Like, this is not a good thing. Like, this isn't just like, oh, you should probably start making your way there in the next few days. Like, holy crap. And then I was like, okay, shoot, I don't know where I need to go. I know that both of these cities have reasonably good children's hospitals. Because, and she was like, you know, you need to go to children's hospital, like, immediately. Where do you want to go? And um, so then I'm like, give me a few minutes. Let me make a few phone calls. Let me figure this one out. And she's like, okay, no problem. So they all walk out and I called Brandy. I, I closed it. I walked out, this big triple sliding glass door thing. And I remember walking out, closing the door and turning around and looking at Kendall. And I was like, I don't think I, I actually, I think the first time I cried was when I called Travis. I was still like in shock and adrenaline. And I was like, not emotional like that yet. It was still like, I got to fix this thing. I called Brandy. I was like, Hey, you need to get to here right now. They said that she's got a cancer tumor, but she broke down immediately and she started freaking out, panicking. I'm like, I don't know what to do. What do I do with the kids? Cause she was home with Hannah and Cameron. I was like, figure, make some fun, get somebody there to take them. Like you have to get here now. I don't even remember who Tatiana, I think was in the area. And she went over there. Tatiana, thankfully is a nurse at the ER. And has, you know, pretty good knowledge base of all the local hospitals and all this kind of stuff and deals with a lot of things. So I called her and she's like, oh, my God, Beav, I'm so sorry. I'm headed to the house now. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, it's all good. Thanks. We'll, we'll sort this out. Like, do you have any knowledge on, like, whether I should be going to Savannah or Charleston? She's like, I, for this, I don't know, but let me make some phone calls. Cool. So then I think I called I probably called Brandy back to make sure because she was still trying to like figure out what to do. I was like, don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. And that doesn't matter. Like just get in your car and get here. Mm -hmm. And then I think I probably called you because I was, I needed to get your info or I needed to get you this info because I knew that you'd be able to call Nancy and Dr. Bill and whoever to be like, what hospital does Beav need to go to? Um, So I think like, the important thing there for for the, a takeaway in this is like try to get some outside information as quickly as possible. If you're, this is something you end up experiencing or if you're going through it is like anybody, you know, that like has any knowledge of the medical world around you, where's the best place you could be right now. That's reasonable. And that was the other thing they were like, I was like, shoot. I'm like, you guys are the hospital. Like you tell me, like, do I go to Savannah or Charleston? You know, like, I don't know what, what's the best. Like, Oh, we'll just do whatever's convenient for you. I'm like, no, 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 no. This isn't like do what's convenient for me. Like, where's the best place I can take my kid that you just told me has a massive cancer tumor? In her? And when I say massive, you guys, this thing is like 50 to 60% of her abdomen, abdomen is a tumor. I mean, it's got her spine pushed over now at this point because it, it's a, they think it's a fast growing. So let's, let me pause. Let me pause. Let's back up for a second because I think most people are like, how did you not see that? Right. I was just about to say some things that you've brought up to me when I was like, <clears throat> okay, like if it's, if it's this big or if it's this pressing, like when you say like, oh, it was constipation, like that resonates with me because with my four kids, it's always like, all right, are you hungry or do you just need to go to the bathroom? Like that typically solves 90% <laughs> of all, yeah. like, oh, you know, maybe I throw in like, are you, are you tired? You know? Right. So. Like when you said that, like I was just like, okay, well, like if it's that big, if it's that like, not from a judgment place, but like, how do you guys miss this? And then, so I, I, yeah, yeah. 
So let's address that because that's that's like the next common thing or the thing that goes through your head right about this point, right? When F Brandy finally gets there and you're trying to process all that and you're like, how did we miss this? How did we let this get to this point? Like you feel like the worst parent in the world and you're like, feel like you've just completely ne neglected your child or something yeah. or in your, but there's a couple of sides to that. One is like, uh, you know, she's, she's just turning nine. They're at the age where they shower themselves, they bathe themselves. They like, it's not like a four or five year old or a baby or a two year old that you have your hands on all the time and you're drying them off with towels and you're getting them dressed and all stuff. Like I don't see Kendall without her clothes on very rarely at this point. And usually it's in a bathing suit at the pool or the beach or on the boat or something like that. So it's like, I don't see her stomach hardly ever anymore at this point, especially yeah. in the winter. Yeah. You know, it's like cold outside. So, um, that, but then, so you're like beating yourself up over that. Then you start to realize like, okay, you're like you're trying to understand like, all right, well, what were other signs? If I didn't notice the stomach and the abdomen being swollen like this, like what else did I miss? Cause there's gotta be something else. Right. And there really wasn't, there was one thing that Brandy noticed the day or two prior to that. I think it was Friday. It was Friday. The, the previous day we went to see Santa and then we were out kind of moseying around because this is just before Christmas, right? And we were out, I think we did some Christmas shopping or something. They went, we, I, th I think we were at Target or some public bathroom. They went to the bathroom at the outlets, maybe something like that. And Brandy remembered seeing when Kendall got up from going to the bathroom as she was flushing that the, the, the the urine or whatever that she was flushing, like looked discolored. But she's like, okay, but I'm also in a public bathroom. Like, was there something in here before, you know, she yeah. was eating these weird candies yesterday, you know, like you could explain it away. And so she, she didn't really think much. She was like, eh, that was weird, but like, there's probably already something in this toilet. So didn't think much of it. So, well, then another thing you mentioned to me too, as far as like signs, as you try to beat yourself up, even though it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't do any good. good, but this is naturally a place you're going to go to is, is Kendall's always, he has always had rather fair skin. Mm -hmm. And so when you're saying like the hemoglobin levels and things were low, which would then result in more pale mm -hmm. skin. Like if it's a slower transition on someone that already is got pale skin, like, like when you see, when whoever, you see yeah. it every day, it's hard to, to notice. notice those yeah those transitions if right. it's not going from right know. so that was another thing brandy said she noticed even in just a few days prior to that looking at her was like man she just looks really pale like again she's very fair skin to begin with so her looking pale isn't abnormal um per se you know like even all summer you know she looked she was all tanned all summer we were out spent the whole summer in florida and at the beach and in the pool yeah. and whatever so she was like super tanned and then as winter came she became more and more pale again um, but then the hemoglobin, so, and that'll get, I think probably into some of the other tests and results and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, she was very pale and Brandy noticed that also, but didn't pick up on that until we got to Charleston and they started doing more testing. And then they were like telling us about hemoglobins and all this stuff like that. Oh, that's why she looks pale. Oh, you know what? I remember thinking she looked pale, you know? So, but this only goes back like two to three days. Right. This isn't like three months ago we noticed. Like, you had, you, had you missed this four months ago? Right. So the oncologist and the on oncologist is like a cancer doctor, right? They're the ones that, that oversee the cancer stuff. And they kind of, they are like the team leader at that point. And then they're directing the surgeon to do this. And they're like, okay, we need the surgeon to do a biopsy. We need this team to do this thing. And we need, so they're really, they are Kendall's doctor at this point, right? The oncologist. So anyways, we get to MUSC finally after a, you know, two hour ambulance ride with some awesome guys who knew who I was. And so we chatted it up and that was cool. And, um, they, my dad, you know, worked at that fire department. So we, we chat, we had two hours of chatting it up with these guys and it was, they were, they were super awesome. And I'm very thankful for them because they made it much easier for me to, to deal with and process and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and Brandy drove separately. She followed the ambulance up there. I rode in the ambulance with Kendall. And um, so we, we get up there and they start working on her kind of pretty quickly. Not in like this, like working on her like CPR or anything like that, but just like, all right, 
let's get you hooked up to all these monitors. We're going to draw. Oh, Jesus. That was the other thing. <laughs> Let me back up. Hilton Head Emergency Room. They had to draw her blood because they wanted to. No, I'm sorry. They started an IV is what it was. Kendall doesn't. She don't do needles. This is not a. Wait, but even. Yeah, yeah she. I don't do needles either. So there was like five of us holding her down trying to get a needle in her arm to start an IV and she's screaming, daddy, daddy, mommy, daddy, 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 daddy. And they were like looking at me like, what should I do? I was like, just do it. Like we're all holding her down. Just go, you know? Like, yeah. Um, did they get it on the first go round? They did. Yeah. <sighs> ER champs, you know, they, good for them. They knocked it out. So that Isn't was, this, that was it, tough. You hate seeing your kid in pain, but like there's something about like, Oh, we're going to stick him again. Oh, we're going to stick him again, again and like, again. Yeah. Do you want me? Like, <laughs> what are we doing? It's yeah. just, it's tough. I, but in those situations, that's where like, I'm not like, I know she's not going to be injured by this thing. And it's like, yeah, yeah, there's like a moment of suck, but it's for the best. So like, she's just going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Like we all have to deal with it, you know? Um, so yeah, we, we had her held down, pinned down. She's screaming and uh, they finally get the IV going and all that kind of stuff. But they drew blood. I don't remember if they drew blood there or if they just did the IV there, but at some point they drew blood at one of these hospitals on that Sunday. And that's when we learned like, okay, hemoglobin's low, this and that, that we're going to test for all these things. And at this point, um, Charleston, MUSC Charleston had gotten the CT scan from Hilton Head. The oncologist had reviewed it and they came in and they talked to us and they said they thought it was Wilms tumor. I'm like, what the hell is Wilms tumor? So, of course, we're like Googling it. It says very common. You know, it's, you know, she's going to be fine, blah, blah, blah. So you're like, okay, cool. It's Wilms tumor, we think, but we won't really know until we do this biopsy. Based on her age. And I mean, that's what I've been, that too. other pediatricians I was talking to on yeah. your behalf. Right. It's like, okay, well, based on her age and the way it's presenting and all these things, like it's, it's likely Wilms tumor. It's the most common thing. We see it all the time, blah, 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 blah. You're like, Okay, cool. Let's cross our fingers and hope for that because that sounds like that's best case scenario here. Yeah. Um, and but we won't really know until we do a biopsy. And instead of just giving her chemo and assuming things, like we we want to do a biopsy and ensure that we know what we're working with. That sounds like the right thing to do. Sure. So, um, I don't even remember now at the the timeline of when this happened. They, I think, within. They couldn't, they couldn't schedule her for the biopsy till that Wednesday. So we got there on Sunday, Wednesday, they did a biopsy. They had our own IV fluids and China just hanging out for two days. We weren't, I feel like you had a blood transfusion there. I don't remember if the blood transfusion was before or after <coughs> there's a, there's a, some blurriness here in the last month. Cause there's a lot's happened and I, I probably have some better notes somewhere, but she did get a blood transfusion and it like really pepped her up and she was like, like she had a cup of coffee and she had been really lethargic really up until that point day by day. I was getting slower and slower and just kind of like lazy. Of course I was too. I'm like, I'm in the hospital. I haven't slept in days. I'm like, I'm feeling it. Like she gets a blood transfusion. She's like a new kid. And I'm like, can I get a blood transfusion? <laughs> like, <laughs> which sounds crazy. Like all these, all these like terminology for these things. It's like, it's just a IV bag of, blood basically you know that's what it is and they just give it to you through an iv and but it's restoring your hemoglobin and and those types of things and it's just like getting you back to normal in a, in a some sort of sense right again i'm oversimplifying things so don't take this as like medical information but i was like dang yeah let me get one of these <laughs> so um of course at the time i'm freaking out this was not my attitude at that point but i did think i wanted a blood transfusion for sure and so they do the biopsy and they placed a port. They knew that they were going to have to do chemotherapy. Chemo of some kind. Yeah. So. Um, or just continuing to do all these other blood draws and all these different things. So they placed a port in her chest, kind of like just below the collarbone um, in that little like pocket of your shoulder. You know, they put this port, which is like a almost like a permanent IV location. They still have to stick a needle through your skin to get the needle into that thing, but it's a direct line. It goes up. You can see the line because she's so skinny. It goes up into her neck, and that's like a direct feed to her heart. So it's like rapid, which is really good for the chemo and all these other drugs and all this stuff, and there's, I think, a higher flow rate to it. But it's 
it's more convenient than having to go under arm every time. You well, know? What I also learned too from a doctor is, you know, with chemo, especially chemo too, is like certain veins can't handle it. Mm. So it'll just blow out veins if you were to try to Do it put this arm. sort of you know, chemicals Chemical. essentially through. And it would only go, it wouldn't go all over. It wouldn't be, I guess, dispersed as, right. as well as it should be. Sure. <clears throat> so they put her under, they placed the port. They did that first because that's easy. Like, let's, this thing will take 30 minutes. We do these all day long. So that she has a small incision right around her collarbone. They put the port in. And then she has a small, they have like a teeny tiny little incision in her neck where they like go through to hook the, the catheter line into the vein. So I just a couple bandages there. They called us after 30 minutes. Hey, we got the place. We placed the port. Everything is perfect. She's doing great. We're going to start the biopsy. You know, it's going to take us probably two hours. It's like, Jesus, this is the longest two hours of my life. The whole thing took about three hours from, from the time we left her bedside where they had given her some, um, some sort of anesthesia medicines to kind of really kind of just put her to sleep before they really put her to sleep, which is really funny and sort of freaky too. Um, they put it in her IV and they just like inject this small syringe of stuff. And you see her, <laughs> she's sitting in the bed kind of like, ah, and then they start putting it in there and she kind of looks at us and she's like, turns her head and then she just rolls it. And they like grab her legs cause her legs are going to fall cause her knees were up. And then I mean, and it was like two seconds maybe of just Crazy like, how fast boop. That like that's some Dexter stuff right there, yo. Crazy. I feel thankful to be able to talk about it with good spirits now because I, I think everything's going to be good. You know, I've maintained a really positive attitude through this, which I think is super key. I think it is the most important piece of this puzzle is to remain positive about it. But there's definitely times throughout this whole process I was not positive. You know, it was terrifying. It still is. You know, like, I still don't know how everything's going to come out, but I'm positive and confident that it'll be okay. But I just, I still, in my back of my mind, I'm like, is she going to be okay? In the short term, she might. 10 years from now, will she be? Will it come back? Will, will all the chemo cause other cancer? They're like, are they, all these are the, these are the things we're trying to figure out. What are those ripple effects? In research now, you know, but, um, yeah, so they put her down. They, they did a biopsy. So that, again, this, this tumor is like massive. They cut about a three inch incision on the side of her abdomen and they took samples of the tumor. We enrolled her in a clinical trial, which means that they'll just take additional samples of the tumor so that it can be studied by other people and they hold on to sections of it for further studies and they'll freeze part of it if they need to study it further on her behalf, if they need to you know, learn more about it and just have other, other tissue there to, to look at. Um, and there's, from my understanding, I'll say my understanding of enrolling in clinical trials that make it like you have to sign all these consent forms and all this kind of stuff. But based on, I think it, it probably depends on what the trial is and what the tests are and what the experimenting being done is. Um, but it seems awfully beneficial because, excuse me, you get more people with eyes on it. Get more people who are trying to learn more things about it rather than just going through the motions of, oh, but this is how we treat it. This is how we've always done it. Let's just do this. In the background, you've got some university or some group of people who are studying this thing hardcore to see if they can learn something new about it. And if they do, they let you know. So it's, it's pretty cool. And there's no additional cost to you. They're, they're just They're doing it for the education. Maybe they find something. So we enrolled in that. Um, when we thought it was Wilms tumor, they wanted to know more about Wilms and there's like a tr big study going on. turns out it wasn't Wilms tumor, um, from the biopsy, which took, how long did that, that took until the following week. Yeah. I feel like it was a, it was, it was, it was, it was, a week. It was December 27th when we found that out. So we went in December 28th, all that stuff. Finally, she's recovering from the biopsy situation and, um, she had gotten some blood transfusions. They felt good about her hemoglobin and all these things. And they finally, they our, our goal, everyone's goal was to try to get her home for Christmas. They're like, we know you want to be home for Christmas. We can't do anything for you till after that anyways, till we know what we're working with. So like, let's get her into it. not going to start any chemo until they know exactly what they're treating. Right, right. So finally, we get home at like 1030, 
at Christmas Eve that night. So we're super lucky, super fortunate to be able to get her home and have her home on Christmas and for the next few days after that. But Christmas wasn't the same. You know what I mean? It was just like, it just sucked. You know, she was, she was tired. She was beat. She couldn't, she didn't really have the, the stamina to like stay up, but she'd open a few presents and want to lay down. You know, like, man, like this isn't Christmas. You know, that was hard. It sucked. We had some moments though. We got some good smiles and, and, and laughs out of her and some stuff, but it, it she just wasn't her normal, like chipper, fun, spicy self. She right. didn't even kick Travis. Did she? Yeah, that's messed up. She's just <laughs> like, whack. <laughs> Kendall's good. Uh, but, um, so yeah, I remember, uh, the 27th it was the day before my older brother's birthday and everyone was at the house and we, we get a phone call from MUSC. I was like, Oh, shit. this is, this is the, the oncologist like Brandy. So we, we jump, we run outside and it's, it's the doctor and she's like, okay, we got the biopsy results back. It's not Wilms tumor. I'm like, that's, that's not good. Well, I think it's not good. I don't really know, but I know it's not Wilms tumor. And that's what we were hoping to hear. She said, it's, it's neuroblastoma. I'm like, no, nah, well, wah, wah, wah. What'd you say? So neuroblastoma. So now I got to figure out what this new thing is that I, and I'd spent the last week researching Wilms tumor because it was very likely that it was Wilms tumor. Neuroblastoma. And neuroblastoma is typically found in newborns up to, you know, three, four, five years old is kind of on the high side of the age range that you see neuroblastoma. Kendall's eight, almost nine and getting diagnosed with this. And that's very uncommon. And, um, we know somebody whose child went through this and had neuroblastoma and didn't make it relapsed. Right. He was in remission, was doing well and then relapsed. And, um, you knew that you, and then you told me that's Dr. Bill's, you know, his son had that. And that's when I started to be like, all right, we got it. This is a real problem. Like, this is not, this ain't going to be a walk. Like this is serious yeah. business. Yeah. I didn't tell Brandy that I have still haven't told Brandy that she'll listen to this and find out that I've been Can holding that information. Have to have sorry, that sorry, but I, I, I didn't want to scare her. I was holding information that I knew wasn't going to be helpful to the situation. You know what well, I mean? Well, in, in every, her at eight and getting, you know, nine practically being diagnosed with this is that that's already an oddity. You know what I mean? That, 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 that's, that's so rare too. So you start to go like, all right, what were the other mitigating factors for you know, the other child? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, a, so, there's, there's so many nuances you know, to it. You can't compare apples and apples on this one, so it's no. what is that information going to do to? It's not it's adding not, any it's value. It's not going to help the situation. So, so I just opted to not tell Brandy that that I knew that because um, I knew it was going to make her panic and freak out more, and, and it wasn't helpful. So um, once I found that out, and I was like, okay. Um, this is a serious issue. Now, what else do I need to learn about this? I need to like forget everything I just read and I got to learn about this new thing. But you got to be careful about how much you Google, you know, because like there's a lot of information out there and some of it's helpful and a lot of it's not. And you got to try to figure out the difference between the two. And we still hadn't, I don't know that we had told anybody. Oh, I, I had put it out there by the, at this point because I remember typing out that we were hopeful that it was Wilms tumor and all stuff. I, I posted a video on tactical baby gear, Instagram and our personal Facebook page and stuff, which we really weren't going to do. Brandy didn't want to share any of this information and all this stuff. And like I said, at the beginning of this podcast was like, I felt like it was the right thing to do to share this information. One, to get the support from people two because it felt like the right thing to do by Kendall with the platform she's given us that we should be trying to educate parents on. Well, at at a minimum, you're, you're not alone. Right. Um, but the amount of resources that I've gotten from putting it out there, the amount of people who are like, Hey, I know a guy, Hey, you need to talk to this person. Hey, my son went through this too. My daughter went through this. Here's the doctor. Here's the thing. And it's like, 
holy crap, now I'm getting real info. I'm not having to sift through Google for what's real and what's not and what's someone's opinion versus this is actually, you know, whatever the thing is. Um, so I was getting real information from real people who had experienced the same thing. And then other people with other types of cancers. And, you know, we're dealing with nausea. And they're like, hey, I found, we found that this works really well for nausea. The doctors aren't going to give it to you. But, like, freaking preggy pops for pregnant women that have nauseous, you know, they're like, they work really well. And there's, like, vitamins and other stuff in them. Yeah, I wouldn't have connected the dots there. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, a, a good friend of mine whose wife um, sadly passed from cancer recently after a six-year battle, um, that was one of his recommendations. He's like, dude, preggy pops. That's the only thing that kept her, like, not throwing up. I was like, done, Amazon. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I ordered so much crap on Amazon initially trying to, like, try. You're trying everything. And some of the medicine they give her, you know, she's on oxycodone that's for pain because she has a surgery and all this stuff. And, she, and that's the, the other thing. She still was in no pain from the tumor itself. Even still through all this stuff, the pain wasn't there. She took, she was taking pain medicine from the surgery and the incision the and all that stuff and that yeah. pain, but she wasn't being caused any pain from this still. Um, which turns out there, there's a, that, there's a reason why, and it's a good thing, obviously, so, um, going back to like putting this out there, learning it's neuroblastoma and all these things, Mike from the No News podcast, who we've had here on the podcast and, you know, him and, and Dave are awesome dudes. And he reaches out to me, sends me a DM. He's like, Hey, I'm going to connect you with my buddy, Greg. His daughter went through this as well. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, cool. I'm talking to everybody. I talked to for as rare as neuroblastoma, so about 700 kids, 650 to 700 kids, a year in the U. I don't know if it's just the U S I think it's the U S get diagnosed with this a year, about 700 kids, which isn't a lot. I mean, you're talking about the population of the country and how many kids are here. It's like 700 is thankfully enough that they have some information and some data not on it, but it's still rare enough. Like the chances of you meeting other people that have it are probably pretty slim. You know, I must've talked to 10 parents have been through neuroblastoma. I was like, this is crazy. Is this not as rare as we think it is? Yeah. You know, to be able to talk to that many people in two days that have been dealing with it. And I got some really good information. It's, you know, parents asking me very specific questions. And I was like, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, we haven't done that test. I don't know. Like, all right, well, here's what you need to pay attention to. You need to know this. You need to know this. You need to know this. Da, da, da. And I'm writing stuff down. And that was some of the other stuff that parents were telling me too was, you know, and not even just parents, other people who had experienced cancer and all this stuff. Like you have to be your own advocate, ask as many questions as possible, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what does that even mean? Like, what, like, I understand you have to be your own advocate, but that means it's like, do your own research, do all this stuff. I'm like, not trust the cancer doctor. Like, what am I doing here? Like, I, I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. They know way more than I know. I'm not going to like you, you're now on a, none of this stuff you ever have to know until you have to know. And then once you need to know, you're on a fast track, hyper learning as much as you can through and then having to sift through BS at the same time. So that's crazy. But then you start to sort of weed through things and start to understand what's important. So for us in this situation with neuroblastoma, there was things like understanding, was it, um, uh, has, has it spread anywhere? Right. Um, was it, is it in the bone marrow? Is it not in the bone marrow? Is it in the lymph nodes? Is it in the liver? Is it um, a particular mutation or not? Is it, you know, all these different things that are very important on how it gets treated, whether it's this or this or this or that. Now, as far as neuroblastoma is concerned, cancer that attacks the adrenal glands? It starts at the adrenal gland, but it attacks a, a nervous system. Um is my understanding. So the fact that she wasn't having pain was a good sign that it hadn't spread through the nervous system anywhere, which is when I... So when it does spread, other parts hurt just bone because... Pain. Your knees, your joints, your legs, your hurt. arms, yeah, bone pain. Um, which will come down to like the, some of these other treatment things here shortly, but... Um, I, I talked to um, Mike from the news, news podcast. He connects me with his buddy. His buddy was going to um, Memorial Sloan Kettering 
in New York City and seeing Dr. Modak. Dr. Modak is, a, is like one of the only people you read about on the internet with neuroblastoma. He's got so much study, so many researches uh, out there, so much um, publicity. Like this is the world leader in neuroblastoma and he's in New York City. And I talked to this guy. He asked me a few questions about things. I'm like, I don't really know yet. We're waiting on this test result. If we're scheduled to do that result or that test next week. He's like, well, I'm going to, we're seeing Dr. Modak. And I was like, oh, no shit. He's like, I'm going to connect you with him, blah, blah, blah. So then like within a day, I got Dr. Modak calling me and I'm like, how in the world did I just get so lucky to have the world leader in this thing calling me? I'm so grateful for just, you know, the fact that that was able to happen. I have a lot of some other thoughts around it, but so I, I get, he starts asking me some questions and based on those questions, he says, from what I'm hearing, it's likely localized. And if that's the case, you could do surgery and just remove the tumor, no chemo, no nothing. That would be that. And we'd put her on this antibody to prevent it from coming back. Maybe there's some radiation involved, but like relatively simple treatment from what I was hearing from him initially. And that was based on the assumption that it was localized. And that was also based on the assumption that it wasn't this MCN mutation. And I was like, then my brain exploded because what I am hearing from my doctors is we got to do all this chemo. We've got to do radiation. We've got to do bone marrow transplants. We've got to do all this stuff. I'm like, geez, this sounds crazy. And then the, the other dad that I talked to that was taking his daughter to this guy was saying, MSK doesn't do, MSK is Memorial Sloan Kettering, MSK doesn't do bone marrow transplants for this because it's too toxic. I'm like, too toxic. I didn't fully understand what a bone marrow transplant was. My cousin, my cousin got a bone marrow transplant when I was a kid. And this is like early 90s. He was like one of the early adopters, early first, excuse me. He was one of the early people to do a bone marrow transplant. And, um, you know, this guy in England donated bone marrow. It was a perfect match. His name's Pete. He saved his life. And they've become like part of our family at this point. And it's incredible an incredible thing. So I'm like, all right, well, my cousin got a bone marrow transplant. It saved his life. Like this has got to be a good thing. I didn't know the exactly what was involved in that, in that process or procedure, but the doctors, the way they explained it to me was made me want to get one, you know, just like a blood transfusion. They're like, all right, so we're going to extract your blood, her blood via uh, another catheter. We're going to put a catheter in her like thigh. It's got two tubes an in and an out and we're going to pull blood out it's going to go to a centrifuge it's going to spin the blood and separate it we're going to extract the stem cells from that put her blood back in and it'll just constantly do this until we collect 15 million stem cells blah blah blah, blah. and then after you know these rounds of chemo and we do the thing we take the tumor out then we'll do a transfusion we'll re-inject these stem cells in her and blah blah, blah. i'm like Man, that sounds so, like it'll make you Superman. Like, let me get some of that. And so now you don't have to try to find a match because you're using your own stem cells. In this situation, but apparently there's still situations where you have to get a match if your bone marrow isn't good enough or your stem cells are damaged or whatever. Again, my understanding, I'm gotcha. a medical <clears throat> professional, but my understanding is there's still cases where you have to get a match because your own is no good. So that's still a thing. Gotcha. That's always been my... You know, it's always like it's uh, crazy. You know, someone in Germany get a match up with if you need it. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I don't fully understand still. So that was the way they explained to me a bone tran bone marrow transplant slash stem cell treatment. The, those two things are used interchangeably. It's like same same, but they use two different terminologies for it: bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant or transfusion or whatever you want to call it. But it's all same same. In reality, what a bone marrow transplant looks like is they collect your stem cells, they freeze it, they do a couple more rounds of chemo, they do whatever they got to do. Then they do the bone marrow transplant after they've done that collection a few months later. And they give you ultra high doses of chemotherapy, which are pretty much killing off all of your anything good or bad in your body. It's like shotgun approach, like we're going to inject this chemo into you and pretty much kill off everything just to make sure we got it. 
And then to make sure you don't die, we're going to re-inject your stem cells and your white blood cells in there to kind of help build you back up. And we'll do that a couple times. It's going to take two months. No, thank you. So I'm like, oh, that, that's why they don't do it, right? So Dr. Modak is telling me, well, we don't do it. It's too toxic to the body. The long-term side effects are, are a higher risk than the, poten the potential you know, good outcome of doing the bone marrow transplant. It's not necessary for her. It's not necessary for neuroblastoma. And they have developed and been using a process that they developed back in the 80s called 3F8, which is an antibody um, chemical, I guess, that does its own thing with the same idea that you're going to it's really, I think, more of a prevention thing than a killing off more stuff because they've done studies over the last 30 years of patients that have received a bone marrow transplant versus patients who have not received the bone marrow transplant with no statistical difference in the outcome. Doesn't matter if you get it or not. It's not going to change the outcome. Given her So, given her diagnosis. scenario, which I haven't really fully laid out exactly what her diagnosis looks like, She's nine years old with neuroblastoma, rare. She's got the MCN mutation, which is, we'll say rare. It's like 40% of the cases. So less than half the cases have this MCN mutation, which is a more aggressive version of the cancer, which isn't good. But then it's localized, which is really rare to be MCN and localized because it's usually MCN and spread everywhere. And then... There's a lot more treatment involved. So it's a nine-year-old MCN localized, and there it's stage two, which is great, right? Because it's usually stage four, and they still treat it with great outcomes. With like 80% what they call event-free survival, EFS. You'll, if anybody's researching this and they see the EFS and OS. So you got event-free survival and then overall survival. Overall survival numbers are going to be much higher, but those contain people who've had relapses and had to get treatment again and all this stuff. Event-free survival means you got rid of it the first time and it stayed gone. So event-free survival um, in similar cases is like 80 plus percent. But they don't really have enough numbers or statistics on people like Kendall with these same circumstances that are like Mick N, but localized, but you're nine. There's like 10, 10 people have ever had this like that or something. Not in their bone marrow too. And not in her bone marrow. Which is why it's stage two. Just Correct. Yeah. That it's localized, which is why she didn't have any other pain and there was no other symptoms except for what Brandy saw in the toilet that day that was discolored is because she's peeing blood because it's killed this kidney because it's like overtaken the kidney. So she only has one functioning kidney at this point. So when we found out it was MCN, that was the last piece of information that we were waiting for on a test was, was this mutation. If it was not MCN, the, the, the potential to remove, it just makes it easier. It's less likely to come back. It's less aggressive. It's all these things. But the fact that it's localized is still very positive because the chemo is already shrinking. She's done one round of chemo. It's already shrinking the tumor. And the fact that it's reacting to it, they said, um, I'm trying to remember the statistics, but it was like some 90 plus percent chance that, that they'll get rid of it with a event free survival, positive outcome. If it's re already reacting the odds, it's like less than 2% chance that she'll have a reoccurrence. Or something just based on the fact that it's reacting so quickly now they're like the only times we ever have reoccurrences and have issues is if it doesn't respond well to the chemo so the fact they were like the fact that it's responding they're gonna shoot they'll do another scan when we're up there next week i think to see how much it's shrunk but i can physically see it and touch it and feel it and be like oh this is different this is this is good so um yeah, that's kind of where we're at, but you know, the so that's why I'm I have a much more positive attitude about it now and I feel like it sounds like I'm talking about it like it's no big deal, but I I'm kind of calloused at this point. I 
I've cried it out, you know what I mean? And, and kind of like what I was saying before, where it's like, that's not going to help solve any of this problem. Like staying positive, staying strong, being, being tough, knowing it's going to be okay, or at least thinking it's going to be okay. And making sure that Kendall sees that is super important. You know what I mean? That she's like, well, dad says everything's going to be okay. So it's going to be okay. So like she's seen me upset. She's seen me cry, but she knows it's just because I'm upset that she doesn't feel good yeah. and she doesn't think I'm worried about her, you know? So those are the types of things that it's tough, man. Having conversations with her, letting her know what's going on, that she's got a tumor in her body that we have to take care of. It's a very serious thing um, that she's going to have to stay strong, you know, and disrupted, you know, her normalcy of a nine year old going to school. Mm-hmm. everything you know yeah, being around friends like she normally was yeah that's changed. there's there's no no school for the foreseeable future for at least for the the next year you know um her she has no her immune system is like wiped out chemotherapy kills off the white blood cells and the white blood cells is what you know attacks viruses and that sort of thing so um, the other part of this is she's had a lot of platelet transfusions her platelets gotten really low after the chemotherapy white blood cell counts were zero, all this stuff. So we've spent um, the first 16 days of the year in the hospital, which sucks because it was only supposed to be five days. These chemo treatments are like five days. It's like once a day for five days, and then you're supposed to be able to go home for two weeks-ish. And her, her blood counts were so low, she was having to get two or three blood transfusions a day. Like it really wiped her out. And the white blood cells is the only thing you can't really control externally. Your body has to produce that on its own. Unlike hemoglobin or platelets, where they can give you transfusions and give you a bag of blood and give you a bag you feel of that instant give pop. you a bag of, of uh, platelets even, which is crazy. Like platelets, it's a it's a yellow the platelets from your blood are yellow. So it looks this sounds crazy. It looks like a bag of urine almost. That it's cra- and that's the platelets in your blood. It's isn't it white weird? Yeah, it's it's nuts. Um, but your white blood cells are the only thing. Now, we we do give her a shot after 24 hours after chemo that we have to give her at home, which we gave her in the hospital that time. But it's a shot we'll have to give her at home that helps the white blood cells rise once they are building themselves up. It like rapidly helps, and I, there's a word for it and a phrase for it. And I'm now, as far as like that idiot, type of so. administer administration, is that something that Brandy's good with doing is that Brandy a ain't touching that thing. No, she doesn't. No, that's that's Doctor Dad all day, buddy. I'm all over that stuff. The nurse is like, like, "You're have you done this before?" I'm like, "I'm kind of a big deal." <laughs> <laughs> so like, like, in my home, you know, Emily could definitely be the one that could give the kids the shots. Like I, I feel like if I had to, like if it was like, you need to give this shot, like yeah. I, do it, but. Yeah, no, that's, that's not Brandy. Skill Brandy's set. like she she Brandy has will that injure skill somebody because she'd be like, ah, they're both gonna be freaking out and <laughs> <laughs> somebody's gonna get stabbed. It's gonna be the wrong person. Oh, here's the funniest part about that shot. So there's they're teaching me in the hospital how to how to do this shot, and you know it comes in a dose for an adult, and it's like a, a I say a bigger oh you syringe. have to it comes in a dose for for an adult. So they give me I unbox it. It's in a syringe. It's like this prepackaged shot but it's like way too much. So then give me another syringe and another needle. And I, all right, so you, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take from this syringe and you're going to fill this other one up to two and a half and you're going to give her to two and a half milliliters. Um, and that's, that will be her dose, you know, they're like, but don't screw it up. Cause it's like a $6,000 shot. They're like it's free for you. But it's $6,000. So don't screw it up. So anyways, we're just going to fill this to two and a half. We're going to throw the rest away. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, you can't save that and like use it again. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we're just going to use this little bit and throw the rest away. <laughs> so don't screw it up. Got it. <laughs> Anyways. So sounds like I've got some extra here, but yeah. So I give her the shot and they're like, oh, you're really good. I've given so many shots. I mean, between this diabetic cat I had for a long time and I mean, it's just a shot. Like, I don't know. It's no big deal. I don't know. So I, the, Emily gives me allergy shots, but even at that, like. I had to give myself shots uh, when I broke my knee. 
there were I, what the hell shot was I giving myself? I don't even remember. It was some some it was like an antibiotic. I don't know something from my knee surgery. But I had to give myself a shot right here every day, just a little shot. And uh, it could have been for blood clots. I, I have no idea what it was to be honest with you. Now that I'm, I was so. <clears throat> medicated well, on like pain go, meds and you, stuff. you you kind of going through this and just everything else is kind of reminding me of those sort of like when you have kids and you and you want to be like be the best protector and provider that you can it's like i started i, I had a i got like a little survival book on like you know mm-hmm. and so i've been sort of reading through again like all right what's that cpr again like all right do it to the bgs you know like kind of like that be <laughs> like yeah so that, staying that. alive you know and so but just like kind of just remembering like oh man okay the odds when you have four kids, in my case, four kids, and they're playing outside, you're like, all right, someone's about to break something. Someone's eventually going to completely cut something open. Like, yeah, how do you treat these things? And trying to just, I'm not a medical professional, but it's like, how do I get some good basic guidelines here to make sure I can get them to, get the, them hospital to the hospital or, or something? Yeah. What can I recognize if, you know, like my, my thought has always been lately as they like start to learn how to ride bikes you know you mean you're like okay if they fall off and whack their head like yes they should have a helmet on but how many times the kids just grab a bike and start going right so you're like they bump their head like concussions and they're like what am i supposed to look for and just trying Mm -hmm. to not be so in those moments you're not going to pause and go hey siri hey google you know like what do I do about a concussion as yeah. your phones actually light up? That's so funny, dude. Siri's so sensitive probably, over here today. So, so, mine didn't light up, but yours did. Um, but, but you know, just trying to go, like, it's just, it's a takeaway I've gotten from this too is, is watching you and how you've handled it. Your positivity towards it is going, okay, I wonder if some of the, I, I, the, the word I was going to say is like the, kind of the, the, like the freak out of the, Something happens and you have to react, but it well, you freak out if you if you if you got no baseline on how to even approach it. You know what I mean. And so it's yeah. like when the trauma we've experienced in our house has been a broken arm. So it's like, okay, oh, what am I supposed to do here? Where do I go? What? And sort of at least not taking some time to play. So if you got kids, like take some time. Like, do you know what hospitals are in your area? Well, if you've got kids, is are you in an area that's got a children's hospital nearby because if it's the same sort of distance and it's and it's not like a broken arm my, the pediatrician was like take the extra 12 minutes to drive to the children's hospital because they're used to setting arms all day for kids you know right if it was a bigger surgery like just get them the damn you know er and mm-hmm. just get them stabilized and then figure it out but it's those little things that you don't you don't really think about not in sort of the complete prepper gotta be well, worried about everything so but it's like here's what's been you should have some basic knowledge you know here this is one of the things that's been running through my head through this is like i'm such a be prepared for everything kind of guy right i'm overpacked my truck is stocked with stuff tools and generators and all like i, I so i'm ready for most every situation almost always whether it's camping or boating or just general life day-to-day stuff this is no, not something you will ever be prepared for is hearing your kid has cancer. Like you cannot be prepared for that. And like, that's something I've been thinking about is like, man, I thought I was ready for you, everything. You can't be prepared for that. But what you, what you were prepared for is to start reaching out and asking people to give you some direction. Yes. Yes, for sure. And the other thing I will say too, is that my life till this point has prepared me for this. Like everything, this is where I'm going to start getting emotional, I think. Everything I've ever done that has gotten me to where I am now has allowed me and given me the tools to deal with it. To to be able to get punched in the face and still stand up and be like, I'm going to deal with it anyways. Like those are lessons I've learned in business or whatever, where it's like you've had to start over two and three times and you just get back up and you keep mm-hmm. going, you get back on the horse and you keep going and, and those types of things. Giving like, up and failure is not an option. It's not like failure is not an option. Just like anytime I've, I've had to restart with business, failure is not an option. It's just like we are going to succeed and then you just have to get back up and try again. And this is the case now where it's like, okay, well, failure is certainly not an option. I know what that feels like. It's, it's time to like put on the gloves and fight. Like we came here to fight and we're here to win it's time to go, you know, and that's where I got where 
you know, after being really sad, really upset, crying it out, having all the emotions and being like, okay, I got that out of the way. It's go time, you know? Um, and I'm thankful for that. And it's relationships that I've built. It's, you know, everything I am telling you, everything that I've ever done has been some sort of stepping stone to getting me to where I am now, whether dealing with it mentally, physically, emotionally, uh, getting in touch with a doctor, like certain weird scenarios have played out to meeting a person and being nice to the right people and having this weird connection and saying yes to a random DM has gotten me to a position to where I think we'll have the best that possible outcome for Kendall period, you know, and it's, it's so crazy. And now this is going to sound really crazy. Now I'm thinking, thank God it was us and not somebody who couldn't handle it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like laughing and crying because it sounds crazy to say, well, thank God it was us, but thank God, like, thank God Kendall has, has me. I don't want to sound so like, but thank God we are prepared and able to deal with something that someone else maybe couldn't. And I think we're going to be okay, which is why I'm saying that. But like, thank God it was us and, and not someone who couldn't deal with it. And that's a crazy feeling I've had the last few days, but, but it's real, you know, and then documenting all this stuff too. I told you at one point and Brandy was like, can you put the camera down? I don't want to see her like this. I don't want to, you know, whatever. We don't need these pictures, whatever. I'm like, no, like I'm, <laughs> I mean, you know me, I carry a camera everywhere with me, whether it's my phone or a big camera or whatever, but I've been documenting this whole thing. I'm going to make a video about it in some capacity, whether it's just for, for us or for putting it out there, telling a bigger story later. I don't know what I'm documenting it because that's just what I do, but also because there's been good moments and I told you and I <laughs> it was like, I have to document this because this might, that smile on her face might be the last one we see. And if I miss it, I'm going to be pissed or ups not be pissed. I'll be very upset that I didn't have a camera in my hands and I didn't document it and I didn't capture it to have it and remember mm -hmm. if that's the last one, you know, it's tough. And the conversations you have to have with, with her about the reality of the situation in some capacity, right? It's like, I don't, I can't, I do don't want to tell her everything because I don't want her to be scared and worried. And I want her to still remain positive that everything's going to be okay. So, right. but then having those conversations about hair loss and all that, where you're telling a little girl who all she ever wanted was long hair, that it, it's, it's got to go, it's going to yeah. fall out. And, uh, that's not something she wants me talking about. So please don't tell her. I told you guys that she lost her hair, <laughs> but having to actually, cut her hair you know it's like falling out in clumps it was like yeah. it was crazy because we didn't want to cut it out till we got home and but as it was falling out it was like getting knotted up in the rest of her hair so it's just like a big matted mess and i was able to brush it out one time at the hospital and the amount of hair that came out was like oh wow we really got to cut this soon like this and that ha it happened from the time we started chemo to the time her hair came out started really coming out was probably about 10 days oh really from, yeah, i wasn't sure how fast that that yeah they said they said in the first two weeks is what they told us and i think from the first day of chemo to when her hair like noticeably was coming out was about 10 days but then it was about that day 14 where it was like we have to cut your hair as soon as we get home because this is starting to be a thing <laughs> like, right i mean it was just like everywhere and um, I was able to brush it out one time and make it look reasonably decent. And but it then just like really thinned it out. But then it started getting really matted again. And all the hair back here where she was like laying on a I pillow know, and, and turning around, her, yeah. and it was just like coming out. And um, she's been okay with it, you know. And when we got home and I said, hey, and I gave her her first day home, I didn't even bring up her hair. I just let it be. I was like, you're home. Let's have, let's let this be positive but tomorrow we're dressing this hair. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, and I told her that that morning, I was like, all right, listen, your hair is kind of crazy. Like you feel this back here, right? Like we gotta, we gotta cut this out. Um, 
so we spent that, I don't know what day it was, Monday. Actually, it was Monday, this past Monday. We ended up cutting it out. Most, almost all of it. She still, her hair still a little bit longer up top. It didn't come out on the top so much yet. It's still coming out a little bit, but not like it's not just falling out like it was in the back. So I shaved the around the back of her head pretty pretty much short. Just like little baby hair sticking out at this point. But then I like faded it up to her. And she has this like this little bob cut now. So when she looks in the mirror, she still has hair on her head. You know, and it's not like this. And Brandy's like, why didn't, why? First, she didn't know what why I was doing what I was doing. I was like, this will be less visually impacting if we are able to leave something there initially. If it stays and gives and it time slowly to slowly kind of falling out. Like I was, you know, got her out of the shower last night, was brushing her hair, and it's like, it's coming out in the brush. So like it's coming out, but not clumps. Like, so at least visually, it's slowly thinning more and more up there, but she still can look at herself in the mirror and have some hair on her head and feel okay about herself. She still doesn't want anybody to see her like that. She's going to die when she finds out I talked about it here. I'll be in some big trouble, but um, we were really fortunate with the first wig we got her. Um, it fit really well. It was pretty close color and, you know, match and that sort of thing. And it made her feel good about leaving a house and going. And I took her to Lowe's to pick out colors to paint a room. And um, we managed to sneak into Chick-fil-A real quick. So that was cool. Um, but she feels good about it. Um, and I got really lucky with that one. But I've ordered, you know, some others that we're waiting on. So hopefully we have something. But even that, like the resources... There's a few other things I want to talk about. I know this is getting long, but it's important. Here's a few other resources I've gotten from the TBG community on that kind of stuff. Like, hey, reach out to me. Hey, we make wigs. Hey, this. Hey, that. So that's been huge, and I still have a lot. I've been watching YouTube videos on wigs. So now my YouTube feed is just like, top hmm. five things to know about wigs. This wig the review. The algorithm doesn't like, know what oh, to do with man. anymore. I'm going to have to log into a different YouTube account for this stuff because <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, it's so interesting. It's fa- I mean, I... You know, you guys know how I get like, I'll go 110% into whatever the topic is that I'm interested in or need to learn. And I'm going to be like the expert in it by the end of this. But it's it's super interesting. And wigs can run the gamut from like, obviously, costume wigs to multi thousands of dollars, very realistic human hair wigs and everything in between. So um, that's been fascinating to learn and all the different things that go along with it. But so sh- we feel good about that. But Back to resources, this experience has been so humbling on the aspect of resources and what the the people that donate to the children's hospitals and the things that they bring and the toys, the foundations and the groups that, you know, this group donates toys and this group donates uh, gas card. I mean, we've got gas cards and DoorDash gift certificates and uh, all kinds of things from people who are just so kind and so generous and, you know, you really take it for granted if you've never been through it and you're like, people are like, Oh, I donate to this hospital. Like, Oh, well that sounds like a nice thing to do. You know, like I should probably do that sometime, but then you go through it. And now I'm like, that's all I want to do is just like give to these children's hospitals because of how much of an impact you're going through, like the worst moment in your life. And that's like the least I could do is like donate a few hundred bucks or a couple thousand bucks, or if the business could raise a crap ton of money to donate to children's hospitals. I mean, we were there at Christmas time. So They had this whole like Christmas shopping thing on like the floor of the hospital. You could go into this massive like conference or kind of like a like a a conference room, but a big um, like a ballroom type thing. There's huge tables set up with Christmas presents. You go Christmas shopping in there because they knew you're likely spending Christmas in the hospital, or maybe you can't get presents. Anyways, we huge bag of toys that we let Kendall open a bunch of them in the hospital sort of a few each day and gave us activities to do and games to play and keep her mind off of things. And we brought the rest home. We got stuff for the other kids um, that they were insistent. We were like, no, no, no. Like, like, no, you, you need to take five from this table and five from this table. We're like, no, like, we just want this one. You need to take five. <laughs> like, geez. Um, but the generosity of people and organizations and, and all like there's, there's, there's a family who donates bed sheets, like things you don't think about instead of like the crappy hospital sheets they donate these really cool fun they call them fun sheets at the hospital um but there's a family who just donates the bed sheets so that there's like softer cooler funner cuter unicorns or ninja turtles or whatever it is for the kids and you get to keep them the hospital doesn't reuse those but you can wash them there 
and reuse them if you want, or you can wash them and bring them back or whatever, but they're like bed sheets and pillowcases and stuff like that's what they do because that's like, no one thinks about that. You're laying in this bed. Yeah, you don't think about towels or just anything. Any of that stuff, you know? Um, One family donated little mini fridges and put them in every room on the floor, which was really cool because we initially started our journey on a different floor that didn't have that. And there's like the common community refrigerator, but you got like, you know, 40 people trying to use one refrigerator. It was like disaster. Yeah. I can't even put anything in here. There's no room. There's probably stuff in here that's rotting from four patients ago, you know, whatever. Right. So some family who was, had the means to do so donated like 40 mini fridges so that because they, that was a struggle for them. They were like, we want to have our own fridge and have our own stuff in our own room. And so it's like, cool. So now I'm like determined to figure out how, how I can help in the cause to donate to children's hospitals or even if it's just a toy drive and we're a drop off point, you know, that we can take that stuff up there every year at Christmas or whatever the case is. One really cool thing that my good buddy's doing, Mark, shout out to Mark. He's like my childhood best friend. Um, he's going to, he's going to fight in like a boxing tournament that is to raise funds for the MUSC children's hospital. So that's really cool. Um, and is he a boxer? Not a boxer. (laughs) I mean, he's a very athletic guy, right? right? I mean, he's like the all-American football player, lacrosse player. He's like, he's the guy, um, very athletic. And he's, I I think he's boxed for fun here and there, but like not professional boxer by any means. So, but that doesn't matter to him. He's excited to do it. He's proud to do it. And he's like, if Kendall can fight, I can fight. (sighs) It's just cool. The amount of things that people have done for us and done for Kendall, really. For, for a kid that they don't even know. I mean, Mark does. He's, he's their godfather. It's cool, man. It's It's really humbling, and I hope I can do it for someone else, you know? But yeah. Anyways, to that end on the boxing thing, excuse me. Is uh, there'll be a big fundraiser around that. I'll share more information as that comes about. The, there'll be a live event in April in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm sure that you can buy tickets and attend and do all the things if you're in the area and you want to to help support that cause. Otherwise, there'll be we'll we'll be sharing content and links and all the things to, to be able to donate to that. I don't know if if you're listening to this April, after April of 2023, that's probably not a thing until maybe a following year or something. But um, anyway, so that's that's the date for that event. So we're looking, looking forward to that. I'm excited for that. I hope to make it to that because there's a good chance Kendall will be potentially in New York having her surgery sometime around the month of April, we're assuming at this point. So anyways but it's life counter. it's 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 life it is. it is it's it's what you're going through what we're going through <clears throat> and a lot of respect for the positivity and the way you've handled it and the way you, your other especially cameron who's older has handled it i think is a testament to the involvement you and brainy have had in your yeah, it's life we didn't even touch on Cameron. I can't how go just there. Important, I'll really cry. <laughs> just how important <laughs> just being there is mm-hmm. for your family, for your kids. And so Yeah, the way Cameron's handled it has been unbelievable. I couldn't be more proud of her. Uh, she's really stepped up to the plate to make sure that, you know, she's very aware of what's happening and the severity of it. She's a little older, so she gets it a little more. Um, but she's <clears> been an incredible through this whole thing and making sure that, Kendall felt good and happy and she's been FaceTiming her every day, you know, multiple times a day and playing games with her online, making sure she's smiling, um, asking how her day was and, you know, relaying messages from other friends or taking the dog out or changing the baby's diet. Like we had, I mean, we had a couple of Brandy's friends like lived at our house for the first week to 10 days or something, you know, taking care of Cameron and the baby. And we have this ridiculous dog that no one can take care of because they'll, they'll be eaten alive. So Cameron's been awesome with every aspect of it. I couldn't be more proud of her. Uh, but 
Yeah. Well, again, I think it's just, it's that reminder of if you don't think you're doing a good job as parents, but you're there and you love your kids and you're showing them that support and love like that, 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 that's a win even of itself, even if it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Cause it shows in it, in it. And I think it's reflected on just how Cameron has stepped up to the plate. I appreciate that. One of the thing I wanted to bring up that I knew was in the back of my mind that I forgot until just now was letting, letting my situation and letting our situation with Kendall be your perspective, someone else's perspective of life. Like looking at this situation and it, it kind of goes back to that quote we heard that was, you know, you got problems and you got inconveniences. The day you can't write a check to make your make this thing go away, that's when you got a problem. Everything else is an inconvenience. And that's like, I have a problem right now. You know what I mean? The thing that you're bitching about on social media and Facebook and like, those are inconveniences. You know, your, your kid missed the goal and you're all upset and ranting on Facebook like it's the end of the world. Like, shut up. Just shut up. I don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. Like, be happy and be thankful your kid is healthy enough to have the ability to run around on the soccer field and miss the goal. Be thankful for that. You know what I mean? So it's like, I want people to take my situation and let it be a perspective for them to be thankful for what they have and not bitch about stupid stuff, you know? Yeah, it's just a reminder. It is. It is. So a lot of us have a lot to be thankful for that we take for granted. And I still do. Even, you know, so there's times even when the baby's like being crazy, I'm like, just stop it. I'm like, is it really that big of a deal if she's climbing on this thing or, you know, whatever the thing is? No. But so it's in our nature, I think, that like when your kids are healthy, you obviously you want to try to parent them the best you can and teach them manners and do, like, don't do this, don't do that. But then it's funny because immediate as, as soon as Kendall was sick, I was like, God, I wish she could do something bad right now and just be not following the rules. I'd do anything for her to be just able to make a mess in a room and not clean it up. I would die for that moment. Yeah. So. So to all the kids listening, you should listen to your parents and clean up. Listen to your parents. (laughs) I'm coming after you. Yeah. Pick those Legos up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just funny how it's, it changes so quickly. You're like, God, I wish you could just make a mess in your room. Well, there's certainly there's certainly a, a very much an element. I think we'll wrap it up here, but j- just coming into a lot more gratitude, just in life mm-hmm. for what we have. You know, <clears throat> even if you don't have much, like you know, are you are you huddled in a corner with your kids right now because you're worried about a bomb blowing up your building? Like, the, I mean, there's just perspectives that are. You can't dwell on it or else you'll just be incapable of living. Mm -hmm. But a sense of just gratitude is it's it's sad that it takes situations like this to bring it forward. But I think those are those opportunities that you can if it's brought forward to be like, yes, my situation is not that bad or I'm very grateful for X. Mm -hmm. Grateful I woke up today, you know. And that I'm not hooked on drugs. And, you know, like, I mean, there's a lot of things to be grateful for. So, um, well, we'll keep praying and fighting with you. Appreciate it. Kick ass Kendall. That's it. Yeah. Look up the hashtag kick ass Kendall. We've put some stuff out there already, some stories and updates, you know, previously to this along the way. So, um, yeah, check that stuff out. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for listening and watching. Uh, make sure you're subscribed on YouTube if you aren't already. Otherwise, Instagram, Facebook, all that kind of stuff, uh, at Tactical Baby Gear. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace.